On today's episode, we talk about drugs. Did he say drugs? I'm not talking about crack cocaine. We're talking about fertility drugs. I'm Dr. Mark Amos, and this is Taco About Fertility Tuesday. I can't tell you how many times patients ask me, are these drugs going to make me crazy? And for some reason, when people ask this, the first thing that comes to mind is that joke where the guy asks the doctor, is it going to affect his golf game? And the doctor asks, what's your golf game good before this? In reality, most people do just find the medications. Yes, some people do go crazy, but very few women do. Most people barely realize anything has changed. So let's start first with birth control pills, normally called OCPs. OCP stands for oral contraceptive pills. Now, when we talk about birth control pills, we're talking about several different types. So there's what's called combined oral contraceptive pills, which has both estrogen and progesterone in it. And there's also called progesterone-only pills, sometimes called a mini pill, that only has progesterone in it. Now, the combined oral contraceptive pill come in two different types. One is called monophasic, which means that the amount of hormones kind of stays the same through the pill. And then there are what are called triphasic or biphasic pills, which have different levels of progesterone in them throughout the cycle to kind of mimic the natural cycle. There are even pills that have changes in the estrogen levels where it has the estrogen stay on board after, during the sugar pills that prevent headaches. But the point is there are many, many types of oral contraceptive pills. So how do these pills work? Well, the progesterone component of the OCPs is what we're really looking at to help. Progesterone goes back to the brain and blocks at the level of the hypothalamus and pituitary the release of certain hormones. Now, these hormones are called GnRH, the natropin-releasing hormone from the hypothalamus, which then blocks the release of FSH and LH. When it blocks those, it stops you from ovulating because it stops the follicle from getting FSH, follicle-stimulating hormone. Progesterone also works through another mechanism by thickening the mucus at the cervix, preventing sperm from getting into the uterus, which would then prevent the sperm from getting to the egg. Progesterone-only pills work through just preventing ovulation, but much more milder, and thicken the cervical mucus. So why do they have estrogen in them on the combined? Because when you take progesterone-only, It can thin the uterine lining, and that can cause irregular periods, spotting, and other issues. So the estrogen helps stabilize the endometrium to allow it to not have those irregular cycles and that spotting. Estrogen also helps progesterone work better. It kind of gets the receptors ready, and so progesterone works better when combined with estrogen. So why do we care about this when it comes to fertility? Well, from a medical standpoint, we can use oral contraceptive pills to do things like help menstrual irregularity, help heavy period, even help painful periods. If we reduce the amount of periods you have every year, you'll have less painful periods. It even allows us to manipulate the cycle. For some women, if they're going to be on their honeymoon, they may not want to get their period. So we can use birth control to manipulate it. When it comes to fertility, there are a couple benefits. And I think a lot of people misunderstand birth control use. I have many, many people get worried about oversuppression. And although, although that is an important aspect when you're doing IVF, it's important to understand that there is huge benefits from the birth control. And so I want to talk about those benefits and we'll also talk about the disadvantages of birth control. So the first reason we like to put women on birth control when doing IVF 
is because it allows us to synchronize the follicles. See, every month, even though you release one egg per month, there are multiple follicles there that have to grow to get to that one egg. And those follicles are at different sizes. And what birth control does is it gets all those follicles that kind of line up at the same point. I always tell people, if you're going to run a race, you don't tell everyone, hey, just uh, stand wherever you want. No, you make everyone go on the starting line. Because if you start in the starting line, it's fair. Well, for follicles, there is a zone of maturity where the follicles need to get to a certain size. And so although not being on birth control may allow you to make more eggs, you might find that they'll spread out so much in the sizes. Let's say one's 20, one's 18, one's 15, and then you have a 12, 11, and a 9, and maybe a 24. And that spread actually makes less eggs available because that zone of maturity is only around 15 to 20 millimeters. With birth control, it gets them all to line up. So when they grow, they're still going to spread. Follicles always spread. But now that spread is going to be a much tighter cohort meaning a group, and that group is going to fall between that 15 and 20 millimeters, and then you will end up with more mature quality eggs. Traditionally, unless someone has severe diminished ovarian reserve, I usually do want to use a form of oral contraceptives. Now, there are times when people have so few eggs, such as two eggs or three eggs, that I'm willing to even allow the eggs to spread if it means I can get a third egg. But interesting, there are situations where people have such severe diminished ovarian reserve where they can barely make one egg that birth control actually helps, which seems surprising because before we just said it can oversuppress and you might get one less egg and one less egg when you have three eggs is losing 33% of your eggs if you go from three to two. But when you're talking about people who have a very hard time at making eggs, there's actually a benefit. And that is the second reason why reproductive doctors like to use birth control. If you remember in the beginning, when we talked about how birth controls work, we talked about how progesterone blocks the release of GnRH, gonadotropin releasing hormone, from the hypothalamus down to the pituitary. The pituitary then releases FSH and LH, which is what causes your follicles to grow. So when you take a birth control pill and you shut that down, your body doesn't make FSH and LH. The benefit of this is because your body then tries to look for FSH and LH. You can't find it. And so the cells start to go, you know, maybe I should make more receptors. Maybe the hormone's there and I just am not seeing it. And we call this upregulation of receptors. Your body's going to make more receptors to FSH trying to find it because there's so little there to none. Then when you stop the birth control and you start the hormones, now you have more receptors present than you did before. And that's going to cause better reaction. So as you can see, sometimes the benefit outweighs the disadvantage. This is why in women with extremely poor ovarian reserve, who only make maybe one egg or struggle to even make one egg, suppression is good because I can get that upregulation of those receptors so finally I can get the ovary to respond. Because now there's so many receptors, it will respond better than it did before. The third reason that fertility doctors like to use oral contraceptives is to help manipulate cycles as well. And when I say manipulate cycles, what I mean is it allows everyone to not only synchronize eggs, to not only upregulate receptors, but it also makes it convenient for doctors to be able to start people around the same time. Now, at first, this may seem kind of bad, like, oh, wow, they're just putting me in with a bunch of group, like we're the sheep and they're hurting us. But that's actually not true. What they're doing is called batching. Batching is not a bad thing. Batching is actually very good and probably improves your chances of success. Now, I know you're probably thinking, okay, Dr. Amos lost me there. Why would that improve me to batch me with a bunch of people? Well, it's not the actual batching that helps you. What it is is that when you batch, that gives time for the lab to clean in between batches. 
allows the lab to be prepared for the next cycle. The quality of the lab is directly related to your chances of IVF working. And so if you have a lab that's continuously up and never has a chance to clean, to get prepared, to test in between cycles, then your chances are going to be lower. Now, that doesn't mean every clinic that doesn't batch is bad. But the question is, are they cleaning? Are they testing everything in between cycles? Are they verifying everything is going well? And if they are not, that would lower your chances of IVF being successful. The next medications we're going to talk about are Clomid and Femara, also called Clomiphene Citrate and Letrozole, respectively. Clomid and Femara are used almost interchangeably. But the question is, do they work the same? The simple answer is, no, they do not work the same. However, their effects are very similar, but they get there through different mechanisms. Let's start first by talking about Clomid. Clomid is a group of medications called SERMs, Selective Estrogen Receptor Modulators. Clomid is very similar to the structure of estrogen. So as you would expect, if you put it near a receptor that can attach to estrogen, it may be able to attach there. And if that receptor, let's say, does something like positive and makes, let's say, an extra hormone, it will create that. If that receptor does something negative, like, let's say, stops hormone, it will cause that too. So that's one of the important things to understand about Clomid is Clomid can do different things at different receptors. You have estrogen receptors in the breast. You have estrogen receptors in the uterus, estrogen receptors in the brain, Everywhere there are estrogen receptors, and Clomid affects all of them. That's why a lot of people have a lot of symptoms when they're on Clomid. So Clomid, the way it works is it goes to the brain, and the receptors that usually see estrogen and the feedback loop that occurs between the brain and ovary, it blocks them. So let's talk first about that feedback loop so you understand that. In the hypothalamus, which is in the brain, it releases a hormone called GnRH, the natropin releasing hormone. That then goes to the pituitary, which causes it to release FSH and LH. FSH is what causes the ovary to make follicles. LH, luteinizing hormone, causes the ovary to make testosterone, which is then converted over the estrogen. The estrogen then goes from the ovary back to the brain. And then tells the brain, slow it down. And then the brain makes less GnRH, which then causes less FSH and LH. So back to the birth control. Birth control works through the same mechanism. It it basically gives a high dose of those hormones to stop the brain from releasing GnRH, which then lowers FSH and LH levels. Well, in the same situation here, estrogen does this as well because your body doesn't want to make seven eggs. It wants to make one egg. So as the egg is growing and it's making estrogen, it slows the release of hormone, which then makes only one egg grow in your body. So Clomid goes to these receptors and sits in them. And you instead of stimulating them and making more hormones, it blocks estrogen from being able to get there. And if it blocks estrogen, your body then thinks estrogen levels are low, even though your estrogen levels are not low. It thinks it's low and releases more hormones. Now, what's interesting about Clomid is Clomid is a competitive inhibitor, which is different from a non-competitive inhibitor. A competitive inhibitor means if you make enough estrogen, you'll actually make the Clomid not work because the estrogen will compete with the Clomid and that will cause your hormones to drop. Whereas a non-competitive inhibitor You can go up and up on the estrogen, and it can never knock the Clomid out of the receptor spot, but that's not true with Clomid. And that's important because when it comes to treatment, that affects the way you can use Clomid. Therefore, Clomid's mechanism of action is by tricking the brain that there is no estrogen by blocking all the receptors that estrogen usually would go into, causing the brain then 
to make more hormone because it thinks there's no estrogen around. Now, the downside about clomid is it's a selective estrogen receptor modulator, which means it can do things other places. And so at the uterus, it could thin the lining. It can cause the breast to become tender or cause issues there. So clomid, although it's a great drug because it's been around for a long time and has a good safety profile, isn't perfect. So what about Famara, also called letrozole? Is it perfect? Well, Famara works through a completely different mechanism, but that mechanism causes the same chain reaction to occur. Famara is what's called a aromatase inhibitor. An aromatase inhibitor means that it blocks the conversion of testosterone to estrogen. If you remember in the beginning, I said LH causes testosterone production, which then gets converted over to estrogen. So if an aromatase inhibitor blocks the conversion of testosterone to estrogen, you will actually make less estrogen. And when you make less estrogen, your brain's going to say, hey, where's my estrogen? I better make some FSH. And then it's going to make more FSH. And that's going to cause your body to make more follicles. The great thing about Famara is that it has less side effects because it's not a selective estrogen receptor modulator. It doesn't do things at different places. It does just one thing aromatase and inhibition. So the nice thing about it is you get the benefit of Clomid, but you don't get many of the side effects. The other great thing from a fertility doctor perspective is that you can give hormones at the same time as you're given Famara because Famara won't be blocked. Let me give you an example. If you're using Clomid, and let's say you're on day four of Clomid, so you're only on two pills of your cycle. So cycle day four, you've taken pills cycle day three and four, and then you take an injection of Golnilef. We're going to talk about that next with Golnilef, but that's an FSH hormone. That's going to make your estrogen levels rise. But if they rise, we just talked about, it will make Clomid not work because it's going to then compete with Clomid for the receptors. And so you basically just knocked out Clomid from any use at all. But with Famara, because Famara works through the inhibition of aromatase, you can give gonadotropins, and it's not going to cause Famara not to work because all that's going to do is try to make more estrogen, but you're blocking it at the level of the aromatase inhibitor. So the medicine works. So you're able to use both injections and oral pills to get a better response. So one question that comes to mind then is why don't we use Clomid Famara as a drug for IVF. I mean, can we just go up on Clomid and just go up on Famara? Well, the answer is no. And that's because, again, the medication Clomid and Famara are not making the eggs grow themselves. They're tricking the body into releasing its own hormone. But the body only has so much hormone. If I keep going up and up on the Clomid and up and up on the Famara, eventually the body says, yeah, that's it. I'm done. I have no more. And the body has no more hormone. It doesn't matter if you go up to a million milligrams of the dosage. The body says, hey, that, that's all I have. I can't give you any more. So for that reason, Clomid and Famara are limited in how many follicles they can make. And so they're used great for artificial inseminations when you're trying to make a few eggs but they're not very good at making a lot of eggs because they're not actually forcing the eggs to grow. They're just tricking the body into releasing its own hormones to make the follicles grow. So the next category of medications we're going to talk about are the gonadotropins and the menotropins. Now, gonadotropins are exactly what they sound like. That's going to be your FSH. Follicle stimulating hormone is a gonadotropin. It makes the gonads stimulate. Menotropins are gonadotropins, but they are ones that are specifically from menopausal women. So menopausal women have elevated FSH levels, and that's found in their urine. And so what they do is they extract that FSH from the urine to get natural FSH, which is what Ravel was made of, and what Menopure is made of. Menopure also has another component added to it called LH activity. 
Now, this is not LH hormone. It's LH activity. And they get that by putting HCG in it. HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin, can cause the LH receptors to be activated. So they put this hormone into the FSH. They give you an LH-FSH ratio that helps eggs grow. Gonadotropins, such as folistim and gonalef, work the same mechanism. They are FSH, but they are synthetically made. So they're extremely pure. Many of you who have taken injections before can, can note that menopure causes a little bit of redness, whereas you don't get that from folistim and gonalef because it's so pure. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hey, it's Pat Flynn here, host of the award-winning podcast, The Smart Passive Income Podcast, which was created to help you learn how to become an entrepreneur. And in the simplest way, too, you know, entrepreneurship can be very difficult. I like to simplify things. And I interview people like Josh Hall and Shane and Jocelyn Sams and Maria Fela. Who are they? Well, they're people just like you, people who have taken action after listening to the show and have built a business that has changed their lives. And I'd love to share an episode with you that I think will inspire you to get started, too. Check out the link in the description or go to smartpassiveincome.com slash 122 to get inspired, get what you need to get started, and change your life. You got this, and thank you. It is these impurities that cause that inflammation that you see with a menopure or Breval injection. So if we go back to that diagram I was kind of talking about where the hypothalamus sends GnRH to the pituitary, pituitary then sends FSH and LH to the ovary, the ovary then makes estrogen, you can see that we don't even use that when we're doing IVF. We're bypassing the whole system and just giving you FSH and LH. Now, again, the LH is through HCG activity, which is like LH. But the point is we're bypassing the system. So even if we shut the system down with a hormone called Lupron, you can still make eggs because we're giving all the hormones. Now, the question comes up, what's the benefit of Menopure? Why does anyone even use it? Well, that's because to make estrogen, you have to still start with testosterone. And there are some women who do not have enough LH in their body to be able to make the process work perfectly. And so some women need that LH activity. That's where Menopure comes in. However, no one really knows who needs it and who doesn't. And the problem is no one wants to find out because if you don't give it and the person needs it, then you're going to end up with poor quality embryos. So what most doctors do is they give everyone Menopure. This way, wrong or right, they're getting Menopure. No one's going to get hurt by taking Menopure, but they could definitely be hurt by not having it if they need it. So one question should come up is, why do some people respond better than others? And this has to do with what their baseline is. If at baseline, your ovary responds to, and we're going to make up a fake unit here, this is not real, one unit of hormone to make one egg, then if I give 100 units of hormone, you're going to make 100 eggs. But if your brain usually releases 10 units of hormone to make one egg, and I give 100 units, you might only make 10 eggs. Now, I'm simplifying the process here. Clearly, there are other issues such as how many follicles you have to begin with. There are um, other issues that can be effective if you only have one ovary. But the point here is the same, that people have differences. Differences in how many they start with and differences in how much hormone the brain releases to make one egg. That's why we look at day three labs. Day three labs are looking at how much hormone did your brain need to release when your estrogen is the lowest? That gives us an idea of how much hormone it's releasing to make one egg. And we can use that to then determine how well you'll do during your stimulation. So people who have a high FSH level on our day three lab are going to respond poorly because their brain has to send that much hormone out just to make one egg. Whereas people who have less hormone being released, they're going to respond poorly better because their brain only has to send a little bit of hormone out to make one egg. So now more hormones will make more eggs. The last medications we're going to talk about are Lupron and antagonist medications. 
And these medications are the medications used to prevent you from ovulating whenever you're doing IVF or any type of reproductive stimulation. Let's start first with Lupron. Lupron is GNRH. So GNRH, the natural open releasing hormone, is released from the hypothalamus to the pituitary that cause FSH and LH to be released. So when you give Lupron, you're just giving GNRH. And as you expect, that would cause your body to make FSH and LH. So why do we use infertility? Well, what's interesting is GNRH in your body is released in a pulsatile fashion, meaning it's not released all the time continuously. Comes and goes, comes and goes. And so when we give it continuously through injection, what happens is in the first few days, it's going to stimulate. And that's one of the reasons why you're put on birth control before you start Lupron, because if you're not, it will cause a cyst. But after about a few days, then it shuts down the hypothalamus. Because of that pulsatile fashion is gone, it doesn't work anymore. And that prevents your body from releasing any FSH or LH. Matter of fact, women who have endometriosis use this because it shuts down their body and puts them in a menopausal state and prevents the endometriosis from growing. So in fertility, Lupron can really shut everything down and prevent you from ovulating. Now, very few clinics use Lupron anymore because Lupron is not a fun drug to be on due to its many side effects that it has. In addition, it's not a cheap drug anymore. And the third thing is, if the patient overstims, such as ovarian hyperstimulation, there is nothing you can do about it other than cancel the cycle. This is because a Lupron trigger, which is used for people who are in ovarian hyperstimulation, can't be used if you've already been using Lupron because you've already shut down the brain. So giving it Lupron will do nothing. The brain will be like, yeah, I'm already shut down. I'm not open for business. Don't know why you're here. This is the opposite of an antagonist. An antagonist works by blocking GnRH receptors. So things like cetratide and ganarelics block GnRH from being able to release FSH and LH. So you can be in the middle of IF cycle using ganarelics to block ovulation. And then if I give Lupron, Lupron and again, I'm talking about stopping the antagonist, Lupron will then cause you to ovulate because Lupron will then cause a stimulation of FSH and LH to be released. And when we use a Lupron trigger over an HCG trigger, it greatly reduces the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation. Since the fertility success rates are at least identical, if not sometimes better with antagonists, most people have gone away from Lupron, except in certain situations where it still benefits people such as an endometriosis. But most have now gone to an antagonist cycle because that allows your body to freely make follicles and then at the end you're blocking ovulation by using ganarelics or cetratide that block GnRH made by the hypothalamus onto the pituitary and it blocks that so nothing is released. That prevents the LH release that causes ovulation. Whereas with Lupron, you are causing the hypothalamus to not work anymore by not releasing GnRH anymore because you're flooding the system, which then causes the LH and FSH to not be released, shutting it down completely. Now, what about microdose Lupron? A lot of people get microdose Lupron confused with Lupron. Now, yes, they both are the same thing. They are GnRH agonists. They stimulate GnRH receptors. However, Lupron can be very suppressive, and that's why some people don't like to use it on women who have diminished ovarian reserve, but microdose Lupron is a very, very tiny amount of Lupron. And so that's given not on birth control, but after you stop birth control to cause a flare effect. Because I said in the very beginning, it causes stimulation. And so with some women, they take microdose Lupron that cause your follicle to start growing a few days before. So again, microdose Lupron would cause GnRH receptors to be activated, which would then cause a flood of FSH and LH, which will then cause your body to make follicles. Then after a few days, the microdose Lupron, because it's not pulsatile, will cause the hypothalamus to stop working. And then 
that will cause the pituitary to stop working and you will no longer release hormones and you will not ovulate accidentally. Now, because it's a very mild version of Lupron, because it's microdose, you still can't ovulate past it because it's much less suppression. But overall, usually works fine and very few people do ovulate past it. So if you take all these medications together and we summarize them, what you find is, is that we're using these different birth control pills when there are different situations. We're using different gonadotropins and adding menopure to help improve egg quality. We're using different medications to block ovulation based on the situation. So a young person who I'm not worried about oversuppressing in any way, I don't mind putting on birth control. And I'm going to probably use an antagonist cycle because now I'm not worried about her um, not making enough eggs. I'm worried about her having ovarian hyperstimulation. So by using an antagonist, it allows me to use a Lupron trigger if needed, and that can prevent ovarian hyperstimulation. Whereas the patient who is more mature, I may want to put them on a progesterone-only pill because I don't want to oversuppress them, but I still want some of the synchronization benefits that I get from the pill. Then I may put her on a microdose Lupron protocol to have that flare effect. And then there are those extreme examples where someone has severe diminished ovarian reserve to the point they don't even make a single egg. I may now want to put them on a high dose of birth control. My goal is to actually suppress now because now I'm trying to get those upregulation of the receptors. And now I might be able to finally get that egg. And there are even other extreme examples where people have what's called hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, where the brain doesn't release any FSH or LH. And in them, you can't just use gonalaf or falsim. You have to use a 50-50 ratio using menopure and gonadotropins because they need that LH because they don't make it. Hopefully this helped people understand the medications they take and understand why we use combinations of them for your cycle. I'm sorry I wasn't able to do an episode last week. I'm sure coronavirus is affecting you in other ways, and it's affecting us as well. Limiting a lot of my time as I'm trying to focus on keeping our practice open. Hopefully the worst has passed us, and I can continue to do these weekly. As always, I greatly appreciate all my listeners. I appreciate everyone who's able to review us and tell people about us so we can keep growing. I hope everyone remains safe during the coronavirus outbreak and keep their spirits up knowing that many fertility clinics had to close. It brings us great heartache to not be able to serve our patients. We understand the fear that time is slipping away. Together with our voice and your voice, we will let the leaders know that fertility is not elective. It is essential to life. And with that, I look forward to talking to you all again next week on Talk About Fertility Tuesday.